to yet another edition of The Democratic View. I'm the hostess, my name is Phyllis Italiano, and with me today is an old friend and a man who I have a great deal of respect for, I really do, by the way. His name is Bob DeLuca, and he is the executive director of the Group for the East End. And welcome, Bob. Thanks, good to be You're, back. Uh, yeah, I know, we have <laughs> certainly done this yeah. before. Commiserated many times. <laughs> yeah, yes, well, well, we're <clears> the <throat> kind of people that have to watch everything that's going on. Uh -huh. And wring our hands. Oh, oh, let's hope we don't wring our hands. <laughs> <laughs> we go after it, right? We try to do something. Well, you do. Well. I, I kind of help it along by <laughs> getting people like you you to come and talk about it. So what I really am interested in right now is what is happening with these sand mines. Okay. So it's a big question, but it's, it's actually, it's not that hard to follow if you think about the history. So we well, live on, the you know, we live on an island made of sand. Sand is an important and valuable mineral resource that's used for building and construction and roads and everything else. Years ago, people opened up the land and saw this big, great sand that they could sell. And, and sand mines got opened up many on Long Island, right? And they exist across New York State. But sand and gravel, glacial till, right? It's all left over from the glacier. Um, there's some great sand on Long Island. And that sand became a very marketable commodity for all kinds of reasons. Underneath the Long Island Expressway, you know, there's lots of places we use sand. Now, as time went on, we realized that some of the best sand and some of the places that were the largest mines were also on top of the deepest, purest drinking water that we had. And there was a, disc I mean, in the early days, it was just about get the sand out, let's sell the sand. Then we started learning more about drinking water. Then we started populating all of Long Island. Then the population of Long Island needed drinking water. Then the drinking water had to come from someplace. So the wells that are serving people, that drinking water is coming from the supply underneath some of the best sand that in some cases was close by or, or you know, certainly in the same region as, uh, as sand mines. Now, towns adopted zoning to try to control where land use was going to go. Many of these mines are what are called pre-existing non-conforming uses. They existed before zoning. They're allowed to continue on until such time as they essentially go out of business. In the case of a sand mine, a sand mine eventually runs out of sand unless someone keeps allowing them to dig the hole. And in the case of sand mines, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, not the town, gives the permits for sand mining. So the state of New York regulates sand mining. The regulation is a little strange in New York because the state of New York is also in the business of promoting mining. So the Department of Environmental Conservation is supposed to both regulate and promote mining as an economic resource in the state of New York and obviously in here on Long Island. So, you know, the clash comes when we all live here. People are drawing water from a limited water supply. There are old industrial uses, many of which are probably coming to the end of their natural life anyway. And the state says, well, maybe they could go further. And the person who owns the mine says, I'd love to go further. So how about I get a permit to just keep going? And the idea with all non-conforming uses, not just sand mines, is that they're supposed to go out of existence over time, right? So there are, there are things that we did. There, you know, we used to um, you know, make barrel staves or we used to make coaches. There are certain, we used to tan leather. These kinds of activities, as time goes on, really are proven not to be so great, you know, some of them, around residential neighborhoods. And so you try to move the industrial development to one area, the residential development to another area. And the pre-existing uses are supposed to eventually go out of business and those areas are to be reclaimed with some other use. So right now, um, the mines that, that are out here in general are in a residential zoning district, usually a low density residential zoning district because of the groundwater issue. The problem arises that industrial activities in those mines over time have resulted in groundwater contamination. That groundwater contamination you know, is there. It's deep into the aquifer in some places. It's been confirmed by the Suffolk County Health Department. And the DEC, in, in one particular case that we're working on, the Sandland case in, uh, in Noyak, the state continues to try to provide ways for the operator to keep going. 
So Suffolk County Health Department drops 20 wells, does 200 samples, determines that there's contamination. The DEC in September of 2018 says, well, okay, this mine's got to get shut down. By March of 2019, they say, no, on the other hand, they can expand, they can go 40 feet closer to the aquifer, but they're going to have to get rid of the other activities that are going on, the mulching and so forth, right? They were doing some other stuff in there. We disagree with that decision. The town of Southampton litigates that decision. It's, It's in the courts. Neighbors litigate. We litigate. Everybody's telling the DEC this is not the right decision. And, I don't know, a month and a half ago, the DEC finds that there are violations even on the settlement, right? So they had the settlement in March of last year. The settlement now has violations. There's stuff going on on the site that isn't supposed to be going on on the site. So instead of sort of penalizing, as you would expect, they're now entertaining a permit modification which would allow all of that material to be legalized in the floor of the mine, which was the whole point, according to them, six, eight months ago, to say, oh no, don't worry about it. We're gonna get those other offending operations out of the mine We're just going to let them keep digging, which we weren't very happy about. But nonetheless, some of the activities were supposed to be out of there. So when they find that those activities are still going on, they then say, you know what? Why don't we just modify the permit and we'll see what, and that decision has not yet been made. And many of us have submitted comments to the DEC saying this is 180 degrees away from where your settlement agreement was, which by the way was 180 degrees away from closing the mine in September of 2018. But the chaos that's ensued is actually, um, there's a footnote here, but a very important one, which is in that same period of time, Suffolk County District Attorney Tim Sinney was the lead on an investigation that involved uh, the Suffolk Police, the DEC were involved in the investigation, the, the Attorney General's office, and there was a grand jury impaneled to look at the dump, the carting and dumping of hazardous materials, mostly from construction and demolition operations, blended with soil that was then sold to people all over the place, here on the east end, up west. And in that stuff that people were buying was contaminated soil from things that should have been disposed of in another way. So from our perspective, the old mines that have reached the end of their life should be closed, as you would expect with any pre-existing non-conforming use. Where we have contaminated groundwater, we certainly don't want to let those mines continue to expand. Some of the activities, and I'm not saying it's, it's this facility, but some of these activities that go on inside of these mines, like the blending and mixing of soil and, and the things that are sold out of there, have the potential to be a reservoir for illegal hazardous materials coming from New York City, demolition debris, you grind it up like a hot dog, you put it in the soil, and then you advertise very cheap, clean fill, and somebody says, hey, I got a hole in my backyard I want to fill, or I'm filling in an old swimming pool, and you take that hazardous material and you dump it in the ground and there you go. So there's a real sickness in the carting, hauling, dumping industry and this district attorney has obviously taken it very seriously but it points out that the existing regulation on all of this materials management is weak and really almost non-existent. If you can get 130 indictments from one study over the course of 18 months that tells you the, the significance of the problem. So we're trying to urge the DEC to rethink the way that it looks at just kind of continuously extending mines forever because they say, well, if the sand is just lift, you know, lifted out of the site and goes somewhere, then there's no environmental problem there. But we're finding that, in fact, it's an industrial operation. Even if there was no monkey business going on, you've got trucks and oils and grease and fuels and things. And if you think of a sand mine, like a cut in your arm, right? That's a scar on the surface of the earth, just like you would open up a cut, and when you open up a cut, it's subject to infection, like you don't get when you have skin on top. And it's the same thing. The forest floor- That's a very good analogy. But the forest floor provides some level of buffering. Right. All the sand and gravel above the groundwater provides some level of buffering. The more of that you take away, somebody just kicks over a can of gasoline, and it goes down and it gets into the groundwater, and, and Right now, in East Hampton, DEC, this is another, another mine, middle, middle, uh, middle Highway. Yeah, I know it. Okay. They want to go 100 feet into the water, into, into the aquifer. So we're not talking about now being 20 feet above, 40 feet above. We're talking 100 feet into the water table. So now, essentially, you're going from that scratch on top of your skin right into the artery, and you're still arguing that there's no environmental impact. 
it just doesn't make any sense. And so as a result, the town of East Hampton has objected to that. We've objected, others have. The town of South Hampton, I mean, East Hampton may litigate. South Hampton is, I mean, when you have local governments basically suing the Environmental Regulatory Agency, that tells you something. They're not looking for lawsuits in the town of South Hampton, you know? Um, it's a serious problem. And yeah, to be perfectly honest, I, I, I hardly blame a mine owner for saying, hey, if you're gonna let me keep mining, I'll keep going. But the reality is the regulatory agency, and I used to work in a regulatory agency, has the obligation to enforce the standards in the code that protect the health and the environment. That's their mandate. If they don't do that, it doesn't happen. And then all of us, there's some bill down the end of the road. And that bill could be contaminated drinking water. That bill could be the extension of public water to a, a bunch of homes that need it. The bill could be a sick kid. I mean, you, you pick any of the things that could happen from that kind of environmental harm. And honestly, the state on this issue, and you know, if you catch a fish that's too small, you're in big trouble, right? Oh, I know. Okay. I know, because we do, we, we fish and we know that, you right. know. My son measures the fish so he takes it out. So on that end, I think, you know, they're, they're aggressively enforcing those rules. That's my, that's my observation. This to me, certainly as important as the size of the fish that you're catching. It just, I don't, and, and my feeling is that the solid waste issue on Long Island has become so significant that we just don't know what to do with the waste, right? And there really isn't a big plan for what to do with the waste. So you cart some of it, you incinerate some of it. Um, I was at a meeting last Friday with Senator Ken Laval called an environmental roundtable and the supervisor of the town of Brookhaven, Ed Romaine was there. And he said, if you think the dumping problems are bad now, we're about to close the last section of our landfill that took in um, vegetative waste, maybe some construction waste. And where do you think it's gonna go? Well, Pine Barrens, any place, you know, it's, it's, so, you know, more than ever, you need to be vigilant because the volume of stuff just keeps coming. And now, you know, to put it back on ourselves, we have to think about somebody, I'm gonna clear out two acres of property, five acres of property. I've seen this. If you've ever been driving east on County Road 39, right, come off the Sunrise Highway. Yeah. You can see five or six trucks full of cut lumber going into some building supply yard, right, to make a house. And you can see five or six trucks hauling out the forest going the other way. Oh, God. But that forest has got nowhere to go. You just drive it, event. you can maybe dump it in Brookhaven, maybe you can take a, grind it up someplace. You know, we've lost control of solid waste. And the municipal waste stream is like only a part of that. So when we closed the landfills years ago because they were contaminating the aquifer, you know, there was, there was significant effort made to try to recycle more, to try to reduce waste and all these kinds of things. Um, hasn't been great, some progress has been made, but the whole other side of the equation, the kind of vegetative waste, that's everything from people clearing trees or shrubs or grass clippings, all this stuff, where's it go? Most people have no idea. Guy comes in a truck, says, you want me to get this out of here? You say, fine, the guy says, it's another 50 bucks. You go, okay. And it's gotta go someplace. <laughs> we don't afford it to go anymore. So we're in this weird kind of inflection point where, you know, there's this, this veneer of like, it's under control because I, I don't see it on the side of the road, right? But where is it going? And who's watching where it goes? And then once it gets there, who's watching what it gets blended with or cooked up with and goes back out the other way as something else that then maybe comes back to somebody else's yard. And you know, it's not just the words of a crazy environmentalist. This is the Suffolk County District Attorney with a year and a half long grand jury investigation concluding that this entire industry is pretty much out of whack and is now proposing very significant criminal penalties which don't currently exist for misbehavior in these areas. But sand mines are part of the overall like I say, it's an ecosystem, the overall ecosystem of carting and hauling and materials management all across the state, but right here on Long Island as well. And that industry is, you know, in my opinion, very poorly regulated by the DEC and very lightly regulated when it is regulated. And as we know in this local case, even when violations are found, the DEC in this case says, you know what, let's find a way around it. Let's find a way to kind of give you a permit that lets you do what you want to do anyhow probably not what they should be doing, which is why there's litigation asking them like to remember what their job is, what their charge is, 
And, you know, we have a governor who I know cares about water. He's committed a lot of money to water in, in his budgets and everything else. But you can't have the kind of disconnect where you're saying, look, we're going to spend a lot of money. We're going to put clams in the water here and we're going to try to do this. <laughs> Great. Oysters. <laughs> right? I got no problem with that. But yeah. over there is a 130 count indictment for hazardous materials, hauling, dumping, and so forth. You got to get on that. And, you know, skip the oysters for a year. Work on that because that's the real problem in oh, some oh. cases, and I, you know, and I wish you know I don't have a magic solution here, and I and I and I should say very clearly, this is not a simple thing to resolve. Yeah. But the longer we pretend that it's all just fine, and that there's some hole in the ground somewhere that you and I may never see, is in Yapank or who knows where, <laughs> and it, it's all going to just go in there and it's going to come out as something else. And maybe it ends up back on my front yard because I ordered some mulch from somebody. I don't know. I mean, think about it. You ever check that mulch that comes to your house? Where's it come from? What's in it? I don't know what's in it. And the state's just kind of out of control. It's out of their control. And as a former person who worked for a regulatory agency, you got to have the confession of the problem if you ever want to get something. You can't just keep going, oh, no, no, let's, let's do, it. do this. A permit's good. Come in, fix it up. Um, no, don't worry about it. Give another permit to that guy to go 100 feet into the aquifer. Give another permit to that guy 80 feet into the aquifer. You're still 50 feet above the aquifer. You're good, even though the aquifer is contaminated. You could make a million excuses. You could come up with a million reasons why it's all good. I don't think it's good. And I think the Suffolk County District Attorney found that we've got real problems here. And at some point, and I pray that it doesn't happen, but at some point it's very likely that that contamination ends up in a well, in some water supply system, in a creek, in a harbor. All the things that we knew happened when we closed the landfills back in the 90s in the first place. That's why we closed them, because they leaked. And they leaked into the aquifer, and the aquifer was something that we were all committed for 40 years to protect. So we're missing the boat on this next wave of solid waste that we have to deal with. And again, I don't pretend for a second that this is an easy fix, but the longer we wait, the more complicated the mess is going to be at the end and the more it's going to cost everybody. And I would want to see our Department of Environmental Conservation leading that charge as opposed to denying that it exists. And I will tell you, in the court papers that I've read related to the case with the sand land mine, the state DEC is contending essentially that the county health department doesn't know what it's doing and that the samples from the mine owner essentially are better and more accurate, you know, because they don't find as much. County's been doing this for years, and, that, and the DEC has been working with the county to do these projects. But suddenly, the, the county's lost its mind, doesn't know what it's doing. What's the motivation for that? So it's, it's really to the point where it's like, you know, God. it doesn't pass the smell test anymore. And so we're, you know, and I'm not just complaining to you. You know, we are working with our elected officials. Uh, Assemblyman Thiel has been extremely I know. great on this. I know. He's been working it every way he can. The town of Southampton and East Hampton are trying to uh, make their own set of regulations for monitoring around mines, which we very much support. Um, Assemblyman Thiel uh, has a bill now which would prohibit the expansion of any mine where contamination is found. And this is all for Long Island because Long Island has a unique geologic That's feature right. that much of, the, uh, much of New York doesn't. And that may be part of the reason why, you know, the Albany people are like, I don't know what you're complaining about. You know, we got a sand mine in Fulton County. Nobody cares. Um, but it's a totally different system and all of our, I mean, if, if you imagined taking those industrial uses and plopping them on top of the Croton Harmon Reservoir system, people would think you were nuts, right? I mean, reservoir is supposed to be water surrounded by a big chunk of woods and no development to keep the water pure. It's the same thing here, except the water's down there. And we drive on it, we build on it, we do industrial processing on it, and then we're like, well, I can't believe it's contaminated. How did that happen? <laughs> You know, <laughs> do you present the case, holy mackerel? <laughs> well, it's just you know, and I, I, I'm sympathetic. I worked in a, in a re I worked for the county health department, and I worked in a regulatory agency, and it's not easy, and you never have enough people, and you never have enough resources, and the public thinks you're a pain in the rear end. But the fact of the matter is, that's your charge, and with that charge to protect public health and protect the environment, you have to make the difficult decisions. Which means sometimes you got to take somebody's fish that's too small. And sometimes you've got to figure out what we're going to do with the millions of metric tons of vegetative organic waste that's driving around Suffolk County, ending up somewhere. Oh, it was funny. The same meeting I was, not funny, but it was interesting. The same meeting I was at last Friday, the director of the Pine Barrens Commission was there. 
And he was like, oh, you think it's bad in Brookhaven? I got another story for you. The central Suffolk Pine Barrens has now become a repository for illicit, illegal dumping because people get in there and there's not a lot of people need to find a woods road or whatever. Oh, yes, I know I have heard of this. Yes. So now they've got a problem, which oh, is God. either they don't deal with it or if they do deal with it, it costs money to, to, to get that stuff out of there. So you're really just moving it around, right? You're just moving the problem around. It's like if you don't want to regulate it in the hole in the ground, then you got a problem there. If you turn a blind eye to the stuff that's getting dumped every place, that's another place where it's going to eventually turn up somewhere. And, you know, a perfect example in, in uh, Spionk, there's this long plume that runs really from almost the edge of the Pine Barrens all the way down through Spionk. Nobody knows how it got there. It's, you know, volatile organic chemicals. What somebody was probably doing for probably 20 years was taking a 55-gallon drum of some degreasing agent or whatever and 11 o'clock at night driving down some dead end and, and it went into the ground and then it came under, you know, it came under Spionk. So it's pretty easy here because we don't have, like I grew up in an area that was underlaid by bedrock and you have issues there too, but if you dump something in the ground that doesn't seep down 400 feet and go six miles that's in that right, direction that's right. and pop up in somebody's well. Yep. And so that different, if you look at the population of Long Island and it's very vulnerable geography or geology, you know, you really have to work precisely with how you manage potential contaminants. And it is different than areas that have different types of geologic um, foundation, whether it's bedrock or what have you. And there's a lot of us here. 1.6 million people in Suffolk County and probably another million in Great Nassau and whoever. I mean, Long Island, I think, is the most populous island in the country, for sure. Actually, as a matter of fact, there's some, some statistics that I have that I, I think I originally got from you mm -hmm. that if you put Suffolk County with Nassau County and Queens, it's the second or third, something like that, Most densest country area, yeah. in the world. I think I'm in the world. Chris Kobler, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dentists. Yeah. Like Can you Bangladesh, believe that? Right. This is a this is a county that in 1950 there were 250,000 people. Right. And now it's 1.6 million. Yep. And we don't even know that's only the ones we count. Right. What about the ones we don't count? Yep. The undocumented people that are living around mm -hmm. here. I mean, it's really, really amazing. And we're all standing shoulder to shoulder on top of that Croton Harmon Reservoir. Right? <laughs> oh, God in heaven. And, you know, and it's out of sight, right? So you don't see if any of these things were happening around a very beautiful surface water reservoir, the world would be up in arms. Like, what are you crazy? You cannot, this is a reservoir. Right. Still, after as many years as I've been doing this, the idea that we have a reservoir down there that we draw upon is, it's, you know, people have a very hard time wrapping their mind around that. Absolutely. And One time they did it on LTV, asking people, oh, yeah, where, the water where does the water come from? Right. Oh, the tap. Oh, it comes from the reservoir upstate. People had somewhere. no idea that right. the water came from under their feet. Nope. And it's kind of hard. It, it's just, it's a constant struggle to try to get that message across to people because once you make that connection and you see a big bag of pesticide or something you're thinking about dumping on your lawn because you have some grubs or whatever, like you really start to think about it just a little bit differently. Like I say, everything that you think about dumping on your lawn, think about dumping on the reservoir system for the city of New York, right? Because it's the same thing. And once you look at it that way, you start thinking a little more seriously about what you're going to allow to happen. And then look, I mean, it is different. We do live on top of it. I'm not saying we're all going to go away. But like anything, you need to be really, really careful when you're on a resource that is that vulnerable if we're going to have a long-term sustainable society that we want to live in. Um, you know, do we really want to be bottle, bringing in bottled water? I mean, where do you go with this? You really have to, you know, and we've had pesticide contamination. We've had, you know, metals contamination, volatile organic chemical contamination all over the place. And, you know, East Hampton and South Hampton and the North Fork it is considered to be this, you know, this sort of, you know, pastoral hinterland. Pristine is the word, yeah. I think. And, you know, I guess by comparison to the places you, you go through to get here, <laughs> you know, it, it looks that way. But we really have to take those problems seriously. And I'm very glad to see the town board here picking it up and the town board in Southampton picking it up. Um, 
and you know, and that's of course on top of the whole wastewater issue, which we've talked about too. So we also have, you know, three hundred and sixty thousand septic systems that don't really treat nitrogen so well. And oh God. That's, I mean, in some ways, we're blessed that we have any good water left at all. <laughs> You're right. I'm trying to remain optimistic. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, <laughs> we do. And you know, uh, that's great. And I really hope that we can maintain that. But it's just like everything else. If you if you never take care of your health and you get sick, you shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> if you never take care of the environment and the natural infrastructure that supports your community and it falls apart, you shouldn't be surprised. You know, I always say that when you can't drink the water, what you have is nothing. Yeah. And that is the truth. And people do not realize this. And you're absolutely so right about everything you have to say. But I agree with you. Where do you put this stuff? Where's it going to go? Well, I mean, one of the things that, and this is very simple, we have to start managing our property within the boundaries of our property. If I mow my grass, my grass clippings stay on my lawn. There shouldn't be a person in a truck oh, yeah. filled with fuel oh, driving yeah. those clippings somewhere. Yeah. Why do I have to clean out the brush in the back of my yard? It's always been there. It's a tiny, it, leave it, leave it alone. Why do all the leaves in my yard have to be hauled somewhere? Put them in a pile, right? I mean, we have a vision for how we think the landscape should look. It's not, it doesn't match with the sensitivity of the land that we're living on. Bob, you truly and truly are one of, the, I would say, the smartest guys I know. And you, you present the problem in such a way that I can only hope that we can solve it. Thank you for coming Thanks one more time. My God almighty, you always present so much to us, really.